Let's start with some basic facts about potassium. Potassium belongs to the family of alkali metals, which includes lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, cesium, and francium. Now, lithium, rubidium, cesium, and francium are not found in the body or, or they're found in only trace amounts, and they have no known physiological role. However, lithium is often used to treat bipolar disorder. On the other hand, sodium and potassium are the two most abundant extracellular and intracellular ions, respectively. For example, the typical extracellular sodium concentration is 140 milliequivalents per liter, while the intracellular sodium concentration is about 12 milliequivalents per liter. On the other hand, intracellular potassium concentration is about 150 milliequivalents per liter, while the extracellular potassium concentration ranges between 3.5 to 5.5 milliequivalents per liter. All right, now that we know that, let's ask this question. How are these concentration differences between the intracellular and extracellular compartments established for sodium and potassium ions? Well, the concentration differences are established by the sodium-potassium ATPase. Now, the sodium-potassium ATPase transports three sodium ions from the intracellular fluid compartment to the extracellular fluid compartment in exchange for two potassium ions. Also, these concentration differences play a central role in establishing the resting membrane potential. For example, an intracellular and extracellular potassium concentration of 150 and 3.5 milliequivalents per liter yields an equilibrium potential of minus 95 millivolts, while an intracellular and extracellular sodium concentration of 12 and 140 milliequivalents per liter, respectively, yields an equilibrium potential of plus 60 millivolts for sodium. However, because the cell membrane is mostly permeable to potassium, as denoted by the presence of this potassium ion channel, the resting membrane potential for most cells is approximately minus 70 millivolts, which is closer to the potassium equilibrium potential. Now, because the cell is mostly permeable to potassium ions, it means that changes in intracellular and extracellular potassium ion concentration will have a more profound effect on the resting membrane potential than changes in the intracellular and extracellular sodium ion concentration. For example, increasing the extracellular potassium concentration from 3.5 to 8 milliequivalents per liter causes the resting membrane potential to become less negative. In other words, it shifts it from minus 70 millivolts to approximately minus 50 millivolts, while the potassium equilibrium potential shifts an equivalent amount. In other words, from minus 95 to minus 75 millivolts. So what effect does a less negative membrane potential have on the body? Well, making the membrane less negative makes cells less excitable, which can have a profound effect on cardiac conduction neuromuscular activity, and vascular resistance, just to name a few. Therefore, maintaining extracellular potassium within its normal range is critical. For example, an extracellular potassium concentration of less than 3.5 milliequivalents is considered low and is referred to as hypokalemia, while an extracellular potassium concentration between 3.5 and 5.5 milliequivalents is considered normal. And finally, an extracellular potassium concentration greater than 5.5 milliequivalents per liter is considered high and is referred to as hyperkalemia. Okay, now that we have that out of the way, let's ask our final question. What factors determine extracellular potassium concentration? Now, there are three important factors that determine extracellular potassium ion concentration. First, the movement of potassium ions between the intracellular and extracellular compartments. Second, potassium intake and absorption along the digestive tract. And third is the excretion and reabsorption of potassium by the kidneys.